What is up guys, Blue Spooky here with another daily video. If you guys are enjoying these daily videos and the longer videos, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. Doing all of those helps to make sure the videos and the channel do well, and that I can continue making these videos for a long time to come. I've been receiving a lot of flags on my videos lately for cursing, quote-unquote, even though I try to make sure to censor all the words I think would be bad enough for YouTube to flag me. So, if you guys want to support the channel a little bit further, you can go ahead and click that join button below the subscribe button. It's only $2 a month, and you get a special icon next to your name when you comment, and special emoticons when you comment as well. It's not strictly necessary, of course, it's just something you can do if you want to support the channel further, and there will never be content behind a paywall. Anyway though, guys, without further ado, I will get right into the stories, I hope you enjoy them, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks for watching. Back when I was in high school, I would often go over to my friend's house to have drinks together. She lived on the outskirts of town, and I remember that I would have to walk down dark, unlit forest roads to get home from her place. It was usually fine in the summer, but in the darker months, it was way too creepy. Well, I say it was too creepy, but I still walked there and back at least twice a week. It was great to have a place to drink and chat without being disturbed by anyone. The walk home was always a bit daunting, but thanks to the wonderful power of alcohol flowing through me, I managed to summon up the courage to hit the road, even when it was pitch black out. The road she lived down was dark and deserted now, but it used to be quite a popular one. It ceased being popular when the soccer stadium in our town shut down and the team moved away. I would walk home from my friend's house down this old, desolate road, which was always empty and quiet. One night, in one of the darker months, I suddenly heard some voices while I was walking home. I guessed it must have been about two or three men out there somewhere in the darkness. Well, this is where you'll have to forgive my teenage curiosity and stupidity. I wanted to see who those voices belonged to, the reason for this is because there were rumors around town that the area near the old stadium was a haunt for gay people. I was dumb and drunk, so I thought that maybe I should take a look and see if those rumors were true or not. It was not the best move on my part. I know I can blame the booze and say that my drunken state motivated me to go into the woods, but even still it was a dumb thing to do. I guess I was always a little too bold whenever I started drinking. I knew the woods quite well, so I thought I would go completely unnoticed. As I approached, I saw some silhouettes through the gaps in the trees. It looked like there was one man who was surrounded by other men. The guy in the middle almost looked as though he was floating. It was the strangest thing to me in my drunken state of mind. The guy's legs were dangling above the ground. Another guy was grabbing the legs of this floating man. I wanted to see what the hell was going on here, so I decided to move a little closer. I was close enough now for the mumbled and half-whispered voices to be heard a little. I was watching where I was going, but I stepped on a dead branch. I thought maybe it could take some of my weight, but it snapped almost a second later. The mumbling voices stopped instantly, and there was an awkward silence in the air. I was feeling full of regret and fear now. Why did I even come down here to see what they were doing? I should have known this was a bad idea. The very next moment, something unexpected happened. I heard a snorting kind of laugh, a nasty, wicked laugh. I saw three silhouettes were now facing toward me. I prayed that I was hidden in the darkness of the trees and stood there silently bracing myself to run at any moment. A male voice then called out, Oh, so you want to be next, huh? That was enough for me. I ran as fast as I could, 
and I didn't stop running until I saw street lights. I got home without anything further happening, but it really was scary for me. I didn't really understand what was happening at the time. I guess I was too innocent and naive. I know what it means nowadays, though, and by the end of this, you'll know too. When I got to class the following day, I noticed crowds of gathered students all chatting away. It didn't take long for me to find out what the topic of discussion was. Several of my friends wanted to tell me the news. Apparently, someone had been found in the forest by the old stadium and had seemingly taken their own life. There were cops all over town now asking people questions. They found their body hanging from a tree in the woods. I think what I saw was some sort of organized criminal activity or something. The staging of a suicide out there in those woods that night. Those other men had taken that person's life, and I saw them setting the scene when I was snooping around. This was a long time ago, by the way. Back probably when prejudices towards certain lifestyles were more expected. I wonder if the reason that person lost their life was down to the location they were in that night, and because of those awful rumors. If that's so, then the question I was asked by those men in the shadows is even more terrifying. On my way home that night, I did report what I saw anonymously from a nearby phone booth, but I don't think anything was made of it. I can say that with confidence, because five more men were discovered over a ten-year period after, and I wouldn't be surprised if all those men shared something in common. Thankfully, the old stadium was demolished during that period, and that area isn't there anymore. I hate to see nature get destroyed for more concrete constructions, but in this case, I feel kind of good that area was removed. I grew up in the rural countryside of Japan. My family used to own and maintain rice fields for a living. Everyone in the family would always pitch in and lend a hand. This was before I was born. Everyone in the family would always pitch in and lend a hand. This is before I was born, but my family had ownership of the land still. The thing about rice fields is that they're governed by water supply. A waterway. The waterway was a bone of contention between the owners of each field back then. It seemed as though everyone was in constant dispute with one another over water rights. Everyone was on bad terms, and I remember hearing lots of stories when I was a kid. It sounded like there were physical fights, ambushes, lots of pettiness as well. All of the families lived relatively close to one another, so I can imagine how awkward it must have been to meet eyes with your enemy whenever you went out to the fields. Over the years, the number of rice field owners in the area drastically decreased, and it seemed like the rice fields couldn't live up to the reputation my family had given them. It just wasn't a place I could think of as dangerous any longer. In the past, it sounded like they were at each other's throats day in and out, but by the time I was 10 years old, Nobody even really bothered with the rice fields anymore. If you spoke the family name of my family's rival, though, the scars of their memories would seem as fresh as the water flowing through the waterway. I guess one day, the water flowing through that waterway stopped. Despite the fields not being used much, the water flow and the waterway was needed by a rural village. We depended on that water. So, the family house, affected most by the lack of water from the waterway, went in search of whatever was blocking the area. They did a systematic search and cleared the area bit by bit, where they made a morbid discovery. There were piles of bones collecting masses of dead leaves around them in the waterway. When I first heard this, I was with my family. My grandma reacted quite strangely. I don't know if she meant for the following to be said under her breath out loud, but it was loud enough for me to hear what she said. Oh, they finally found you, huh? I didn't ask what that meant, 
I came to realize over the years that there was something behind those words, an implication that I didn't want to know. My grandma must have killed someone, or knew someone who did. I suppose if you throw charred bones in the waterway, they won't get found for quite a while. Our waterway was a really deep one as well, so I guess it makes sense they weren't discovered until after a blockage was formed around them. Still though, it was a very scary and unnerving thing to hear my grandma say. It was about 28 to 29 years ago, after I graduated from high school. I got a job in Saitama. It's a prefecture in Japan, which neighbors Tokyo. I got a second-hand car after a couple of months of moving to Saitama, and you really need it out there. I was glad I had gotten one. I used to go on these long, relaxing drives after work. I would listen to my music, smoke cigarettes. I really enjoyed it, obviously. That was until the night in question. One night, I was on a particularly long drive. I was way out in the mountains, and there wasn't much around but darkness and the sound of cicadas. I drove with the windows down. Well, at least one window on the driver's side, since I was usually smoking. I was heading down a long, dark road, when all of a sudden out of nowhere, I heard a desperate scream. It wasn't an adult scream either. It sounded like a child screaming, and it was absolutely blood-curdling. I don't want to talk about it too much in detail, because I can still remember that terrifying scream in my mind. Trust me, if you heard something like that, you'd do exactly what I did, which was slam on the brakes. I wasn't an instinctive paranormal believer or anything like that. I put a lot of faith into my five senses and I felt like something bad was going on right now. I pulled over onto the hard shoulder and got out of the car. I felt chills rising up my spine. It was the dead of night. There was no reason a child should be in this area. There was no reason I should have heard what I had heard. I scanned the area as best as I could, as my car's headlights lit up the dark woods ahead of me but it was too dark in all other directions to see. I began to sweat nervously. I was scared, paranoid, you name it. I was overcome by some terrible dread. Whoever made that sound, they must have been in danger. I was wondering what I should even do. My legs began to tremble. I thought that was just the thing people say when they get scared, but I guess it's actually true. I couldn't hear anything else apart from my heartbeat and the restless shuffling of my feet on the dirt road. I was so panicked that I wanted to leave. I managed to convince myself it was just an auditory hallucination. Maybe I was just staying up too late at night or something. I didn't hear anything at all after the initial scream, so I thought maybe I could just go. I headed back home. About three weeks later, though, I was watching the TV and I saw those same roads and that very same mountain pass come up on the screen. The newscaster said words I'll never forget. Miyazaki has confessed to the murder and identified the scene of the crime to the authorities. The case has already proceeded to the courts. It was at that point I knew exactly what the scream I heard was. It wasn't a scream you'd hear in an amusement park or if somebody was just startled. It was an end-of-life scream. I saw on the screen the exact area I'd pulled over. It was truly too disturbing to imagine what even happened that night. I didn't have to imagine, though, because after the trial, weeks, months later, the man's actions were documented completely by the media and himself. If you don't want to sleep tonight, you can look up the crimes of Somu Miyazaki but I'll not give him the recognition here. What he did truly turns my stomach. You'll understand why that scream scared me so much that I stopped going for night drives in the woods after that.
I love mountains. I love going on mountain hikes and trail walks, and I used to love going with friends in a group, or even by myself as well. This experience takes place when I went to a certain mountain for the very first time. I'll keep the name of it private out of respect. You'll know why shortly. That day, I wanted to climb to the summit of the mountain, and the conditions were very great. It was late summer, and the weather was clear and slightly breezy. I had read in a guidebook that there was a temple at the top of the mountains. It had been there for many years, apparently. I thought it would be cool to check it out whilst I was there. In years gone by, there was a chief priest, and it was subject to visits from people all over. But according to the guidebook, in modern days, it had fallen into quite the state of disrepair. Perhaps that was due to the lack of visitors. There used to be a small village up in the mountain too, but apparently that had been destroyed by a tsunami, which is why the temple was built to honor those lost at the village. Supposedly, there was a memorial to the event up there as well. When I climb mountain trails, I always keep my eyes open and make sure I'm fully aware of my surroundings. I was about halfway up that mountain when I noticed a few structures which looked like they could have once been part of homes. Seeing those destroyed stone walls and abandoned buildings made me feel a little bit unpleasant. Those poor people. I managed to make it to the summit quite easily as it wasn't exactly a tall mountain. There was plenty of natural light left in the day, and I was able to see the temple. The temple looked abandoned. Thankfully, no one had tried to destroy or ruin it. I was really glad it was still intact. The roads leading up to it had grown over, but it wasn't too bad. I weaved my way through weeds and bush along those mountain roads. I just wanted to see where they led to. About halfway down, I noticed that some of the road had been lost to a landslide, and it certainly looked as though the road was no longer in use. I suddenly felt a sense of unease when I got to that portion of the road. I couldn't place my source of unease, though, so I tried to ignore it and push on. I struggled through a particularly thick portion of brush, and after climbing a little further... I spotted something up ahead in the road. There was a mini truck. The mini truck was parked off to the side at an angle as though it was halfway through a U-turn. It had driven up onto the side of a grassy verge. It looked so out of place. I had just spent the entire morning looking at abandoned buildings and marching through deserted woods and roads. The last thing I expected was to see some kind of vehicle here. I got closer to the truck, and I noticed that there was something wrong with it. I got close enough to see that the door was not locked. I took note of the license plate. The truck itself was relatively new, and there was some rope in the back. It didn't look as if it had been moved for quite a while. There were no tire marks to indicate a crash or movement of any sort. The grass verge had grown beneath the two front wheels. The truck looked abandoned but who would abandon a perfectly good truck here for nothing? Nothing I was seeing here was adding up. I grew more and more concerned with each passing moment, so I decided enough was enough. It was time to call the police and report this suspicious incident. I didn't have a great signal in the mountains, and I didn't want to stay there any more than I needed to. I thought that I would call the cops from home instead. When I eventually got on the phone with the police, I told them all the information, including the license plate number of the vehicle and what I'd witnessed. It was all pretty standard stuff. I made a report and I hung up. I thought about it for a while. Maybe I should have stayed longer to investigate, or maybe I should have tried to find a better spot for service while I was out there. But there was something so off-putting about being near that truck in that desolate location that I just had to go. About a week later, I got a call from the police. They were following up on the report of the truck. They wanted to tell me they had found something. I remember during our call, the police officer paused and said to me in a very sober voice, Before I proceed, I have to ask, 
Do you want to know what happened to the owner of that truck? That really threw me for a loop. Something about the tone and his pacing made me very curious. When I asked myself if I wanted to know what happened, though, I found my answer was no. I told the officer that I did not want to know what happened to that person. I then hung up on them. If this ever happens to you, you might understand where I'm coming from. There was just an atmosphere there. To that truck, there was something wrong that I couldn't put my finger on, and I couldn't bear the thought of being told that the owner of that vehicle had taken their life in those woods or met with a much worse fate. I didn't want to battle with the mental image of that for the rest of my life. The mountain that was enshrined already with a very sad history became a little sadder and darker to me that day. The world as well. You might be thinking, oh, well, I would have wanted to know, or I would have gone to check it out. But I don't know. I think that's just the kind of thinking that comes across in movies or TV, where you're not actually really dealing with it. When you're confronted with something like that, it really makes you stop in your tracks and think a little further. That mountain became a mountain that I don't plan on returning to. Maybe misery and despair are just a part of it all, and we just have to recognize that. I don't need to know. This didn't happen to me. It happened to someone who works at my company, and he's not really the type to share stuff like this online. Somehow, I was able to get his permission. I found it to be pretty creepy and interesting, and I hope you do too. Back when this took place, he was really into photography. I mean, this guy was completely obsessed with it. He needed the right camera, the right lens, the right everything. For the longest time, it was just about all he would ever spend his money on. It didn't stop there either. Every time he took off from work, he was off someplace to take more photos. He would be up early or stay out late until the morning light. He absolutely loved taking photos of the mountains and the sea at sunset or sunrise the most. He took photos of wildlife as well, especially birds. He seemed to favor wide shots of landscapes. After a while, though, he got tired of taking photos of the same sort of thing all the time. Either that, or he just couldn't get the time off he wanted from our boss anymore. I think that's what led him to trying to shoot something a little bit more local. He got some new lens or new camera or something. I can't remember, but he said he was going to shoot some photos of the stars at night. There was a place not far away from where he lived that would be good for it. He lived on the outskirts of town beneath the shadow of a mountain. What better place to take photos of constellations from? He ventured out, and it took next to no time for him to get up to the top of the mountain while riding his motorbike. He said that he went late enough that when he was on the hiking trail, it was completely empty all the way there. Riding up those trails made his journey a lot shorter, but a lot more dangerous as well. It was illegal, but he thought he could get away with it. There wasn't much of a police presence in this town, and apparently he knew the area well and the risks involved. He was confident he would get up and down without anyone noticing. There was a clearing at the top of the mountains, but the street lights were very scarce. There was nothing but natural light up there at all, and that's where he wanted to be. He pulled up to the place he wanted to park at and kicked out the stand of his bike. He put it out of sight under a tree, just in case someone were to come. He started to take tons of photos, tried them from all sorts of angles. He was completely immersed in taking them, especially since there was a full moon out and not a cloud in the sky. It served as a real blank canvas. His concentration was disrupted though when he suddenly heard the sound of a vehicle pulling into the observation area parking lot. He had driven up the trail and not up the road, therefore he had a kind of advantage over the car that had just pulled into the lot. At that time of night, he thought it must have been some kids, looking for a quiet place to drink or fool around in, maybe both. 
If that was the case, it wouldn't be great if they found a guy on his own lurking about in the bushes with a bunch of camera equipment. Since he didn't know who was about to emerge from the vehicle, he hid out of sight by the trees where his bike was. He looked out and was expecting a bunch of youngsters to pour out of the vehicle, but instead only one figure came out of the driver's side door. Not young at all, about the same age as my colleague, if not older. He got out of what my friend now realized was a large van. He started going back and forth with something in his hands, looked like he was unloading something, and heading off into the woods with whatever it was. Then he would come back and grab more of it from his van. My colleague retracted into the bushes even further after he saw that. He didn't want to be discovered by this suspicious man, and admitted that he hid in the bushes until the man and van completed whatever they were doing. Once he was done with that back and forth trip into the woods, the van began to pull away. My friend came out from under the cover of darkness and left on his motorbike. I was told the story in front of some others. It was on a night out. Some of our senior colleagues were saying probably some guy fly-trapping, dumping his garbage out in the middle of nowhere. Someone else said, why didn't you call him out on it? Someone else also asked, what did it look like he was ditching out there anyway? Couldn't have been anything that important. I figured the guy hadn't told us the story for nothing, so I waited to see what his response would be. He took a deep breath and said that it was not garbage at all. Whatever it had been was bundled in some sort of cloth. The man had been hugging it tight to his chest and speaking it and rocking it back and forth. He mumbled the words to whatever it was while he walked off into the woods and the mountains at night and did not return with it. The woods at night can hide many suspicious things. My friend reported what he saw, but he didn't speak another word about what happened that night to anyone again. I want to start off by saying this is not a ghost story. It's a true experience, and it involves bears. It's likely not for the squeamish or faint of heart. Earlier this month, a man was attacked in the northern part of my prefecture by a bear. He was out deep in the mountain, searching for bamboo shoots to harvest. Unfortunately, the man passed away. It was a big story for our area. It was in all the local newspapers, and everyone I knew seemed to have heard of the incident. Not many knew of how the man died, though. The papers kept the details out of print, so as to not distress his family members. Word traveled around town pretty quickly, though. Some locals knew and told their local friends who weren't that good at keeping local secrets. When they found the guy, most of his guts were missing. There's something about the way that sounds that really terrifies me. They say that most of his internal organs had been eaten, but they found one of his legs in a bamboo grove. Native Asian black bears don't actually eat people all that often. If you're unlucky enough to get attacked, then most of the time you only get injured. The injuries can be quite severe, but not always even. The majority of attacks tend to occur when the Asian black bears are startled and encountered suddenly within close quarters. Otherwise, they're pretty reclusive. Some believe that he wasn't killed by a black bear at all. There was a theory that he had been done in by a pack of wild dogs. They found out later that the bite marks left in the remains of the poor chap did belong to a bear. Two days after the man's body was discovered, Hunters had identified and taken down the culprit bear. I'm not sure how exactly you confirm the identity of such a creature, but those hunters were pretty adamant they got them. They say the bear was a parent, and one of its cubs got away. The little bear cub kind of frightens me, because those bears definitely had human flesh given to them by their parents. It's likely they now know the taste of human meat. The bear cub was less than a year old. There's a good chance it might not make it through the winter. 
But if that bear does, it's not unknown for animals that become accustomed to the taste of human flesh to specifically target human beings. The local hunting club is freaking out, frantically searching for that bear cub. As of today, no one has seen it. Normally, at this time of year, my family would be out in the mountains looking for wild edible vegetables, but no one wants to go out there right now. We don't want to be anywhere near those bamboo groves either. I read once about this mountain that's very famous for a weird reason. They say that when you climb this mountain, you can hear the laughter of someone. They say that no matter how hard you look for the owner of that laughter, you'll never find them. There were lots of rumors about this place. Word travels quickly in small villages, and people would constantly try to find the answer to the mystery. Why was there a laughing sound coming from the mountain? Some people speculated it was the ghost of a small child who passed away somewhere on the mountain range making the laughing sound. Others suspected it may be some kind of mountain cat or something. Rumors and theories didn't stop there. They spread all around the foot of the mountain, and some villagers were so freaked out by the rumors that they couldn't bring themselves to go anywhere near the place. They asked someone, anyone who was brave enough to go investigate it and return with an explanation as to why you could hear that laughter. Somehow, word reached a special occult research team at some university. They were more than willing to investigate this phenomenon. They came with various machines and were planning on staying the night and day until the mystery was finally unraveled. This mystery that was terrifying everyone. The team researched the mountain thoroughly and eventually arrived back with their findings. They concluded the laughter was not created by a spirit and not a human either. They had found the source of the sound though. It turned out there was a structure of many stones enclosed in close proximity on the mountain, and when the winds picked up and blew through the gaps in those stone structures, they produced that eerie laughing sound. It seemed the mountain had been that way since ancient times. When the researchers reported their findings to the villagers, though, something unexpected happened. The villagers refused to believe them. They refused. They were certain the mountain was cursed and would taunt them with its laughter, claiming their lives. Others said the mountain's laughing sound was a warning from the mountain spirits being angry at man's relentless destruction of nature and the environment. They got so angry that they attacked the researchers and chased them out of town. When I read about that incident, I got a real shiver for some reason. I used to find the mountains pretty creepy, but to be honest, I think people with strong wills and beliefs that are completely unwilling to change are a lot more scary. This happened last summer. It was when I headed back to the countryside to visit my grandparents. Our family usually went to see them in the summertime, and they lived way out in the middle of nowhere. I know it's not really great to say this, but I didn't really look forward to the summers very much. Every time I went to see my grandparents, I would always end up super bored. All my friends were hanging out together having fun, while I was sat around reading the same books and watching boring daytime TV. I had a ton of free time on my hands and nothing to do with that time. My parents expected me to spend all day studying, but that wasn't going to happen. On the day this experience took place, I was asked to go to the store to get something. I remember it was a very hot and humid day. Even though it was hot and not that nice to be outside, I decided I'd rather be outside than inside. I had always been with my parents or grandparents and never really went anywhere by myself in that area. I guess now I was old enough to be trusted to be around on my lonesome. With that in mind, I thought I would do a little exploring first. I found a trail leading into the mountains, 
and that trail was covered by trees. It looked like a pretty cool and shaded area. It would certainly kick out the heat without having to go home. I haven't really looked around this area, so I thought this was my chance. The mountain trail was much more inviting than hours of daytime TV. The trail was not as tough as it looked. The ground was pretty even. I was slowly going up toward the mountain. I think I had been on the trail for about 10 minutes or so. It was pretty nice. I noticed there were some houses off around the side of the trail to the left. I couldn't believe people lived out here in the mountains like this. I have to make this very clear. This was literally in the middle of nowhere. There was nothing. The houses looked like they didn't have gas or electricity. They were more like shacks or cabins. I went further and further along the trail and pretty far into the woods now. I was quite high above sea level as well. I stopped in my tracks. I spotted something up ahead. There was some dirt ahead in the trail that looked a little bit out of place. I don't know the best way to describe it, but if you've ever played video games on PS1 or PS2, you might understand what I'm trying to get at. You know, when you notice an object or a tile or something and it's a slightly different shade or the wrong texture and it stands out, well, that's what the dirt looked like. I stared at this strange patch of dirt. It was about two or three steps ahead of me. I thought about just ignoring it and carrying on my way, but something was so out of place here. I looked at it. It looked as if the soil had been recently dug up or something. I was curious. It was really bothering me. Maybe it was because I was so interested in it because I was bored. Let me tell you, I'm very glad I was bored that day. You'll understand why shortly. I picked up a large and sharp stone with both hands and walked over to that patch of dirt. I dropped the stone onto the patch and heard an unnatural sound. The sound of the stone clattering with wood. I knew instantly that that sound was a pitfall trap. It was a shock. I wasn't scared. I just assumed it was some kids who learned how to make it, having some fun. I felt a chill go down my spine, though, when I looked down into the hole at the bottom of the trap. There were long, thin spikes, cut into sharp points and varying in height. Some were short, some were really long. There were lots of these bamboo spikes down in the hole, and it was very deep. This was not just dug by some pranking neighboring kids. What was most chilling about the trap, though, was the fact there was no bait at all for animals or anything. The purpose of this trap was not meant to catch animals. It was meant for human beings. I turned on my heels and rushed out of there. I wanted to run, but I was scared that if I didn't look where I was going, I would step on another one of these horrible traps and die. I got out of the woods safely, and I don't think I had ever been so happy to see Grandma and Grandpa's house. I thought daytime TV was a lot better than being impaled at the bottom of a pitfall spike trap in the woods, in a place where no one would hear me scream or be around to help. That's the closest I've come to death. I don't know what the purpose of that trap was specifically, but I was scared to tell my parents. When I was at that age, I thought I might get into trouble for sneaking off. I've never been back to those woods since then. I'm hoping that someone will answer this and say something like, Hey, I know what you mean, I've seen something like that before. Or, something similar has happened to me. This has been on my mind for about 10 years. No word of a lie in it at all. It happened back when I was in elementary school. During the summer vacation period, my teacher had sent us some homework. While that might appear to be usual to some, this assignment was a little different. We were to go into the local mountain range and write down a written account of our thoughts while we were out there in the wilderness. Because of this, my mom, dad, and I set off one afternoon to climb up a short mountain trail in our town. The trail led from the top and bottom of the mountain and was shaped a bit like the letter S. 
The climb went smoothly, and we reached the summit without any incident at all. I was thinking of what I would write about later. I was sure my mom and dad would help me out as well. When my dad said, all right, let's go home, we all headed out without any complaints. He had promised us lunch in a local cafe. We headed back down the way we came. Even though it was in the later afternoon, it was still pretty hot out on the way back down. As we were going, I realized something. We hadn't seen a single other person going up or coming down while we were on the trail. I remember thinking, what a lonely mountain. I thought about writing about that for my homework. I was pleased with my observation. At that point, I turned to my parents and said, Hey, it's a lonely mountain, isn't it? Just as I said that, I saw a family coming up the trail towards us. I just thought, man, now I really sound stupid. The family consisted of three people. There was a girl who looked roughly the same age as me, as well as her parents. Our families were about to pass one another by. It was a bit strange, though. Our family didn't meet theirs on the trail. They had just suddenly come walking out of the bushes from the side of it. I'm not sure why they did that, since the trail was about 7 or 8 meters wide, and there was plenty of room to stay on it while going up. That's why I was so surprised to see them appear. Surely it was also not nice experience to have to push past trees and brush to get to the top of the mountain. I called to my dad, who was now a little ahead of my mom and I, and said to him something like, Those people are strange, or something like that. It was at that point I looked a little closer, and noticed their faces were very pale. They were giving me the creeps. I stayed close to my dad. They didn't appear to notice us, or if they did, they didn't care about our presence at all. They crossed the trail ahead of us and pushed their way back through the branches, aiming for the summit in a linear path through the forest. They didn't speak to one another as they moved forward, didn't say a word at all. They kept their heads down and continued, almost mindlessly. It was such a strange sight. Further down, there was an old man off to the side of the trail. He was just standing there, and as we passed him by, he smiled and nodded. When we got to the bottom, we went to the cafe. We were speaking about the hike we just finished, and my dad and I were talking about the family we saw traveling through the bushes, and how strange that was. Our sandwiches arrived, and we started eating them, but my mom wasn't involved in the conversation. I asked her what she thought, and I was pretty shocked by her reply. She said she had no idea what we were talking about, that she hadn't seen the family at all. My dad was shocked, and I was too. Maybe since she was at the back though, she might not have been paying attention. I nearly choked on my food when my dad suddenly said he didn't see the old man I was talking about either. He also said he thought the way the family moved was almost in a floating motion rather than a climbing one. I didn't see that, but hearing my dad say that scared the hell out of me. Why my mother didn't see anything was really odd too. Did my dad and I witness something paranormal that day? I have no idea, but I'd love to hear any opinions. I really don't know what I saw, but if you saw their pale faces, you'd remember them just like I have. I really doubt I'll ever find out the truth, but hey, it's worth a shot, I guess. I am one of those people who totally freezes up when something unexpected happens. I learned that about myself when I visited a rundown department store. It happened not that long ago, actually. I went to the department store in a city while I was passing through. It looked pretty okay from the outside, but as I got a bit closer to the location, I changed my opinion. It was kind of small and a lot older than I expected. It was practically stuck in the 70s and in dire need of a facelift. I thought to myself, oh well, might as well still check it out. I had turned into the parking lot already. Another thing that's worth mentioning is the fact that it was a weekday and it was raining. I thought there wouldn't be that many customers and I could be in and out pretty quickly. The men's section was up on the fifth floor, 
so I headed there first. They actually had a great selection, and I picked up a couple of great bargains. I started for the elevator, and there were two other passengers on board. When the doors to the elevator open, sometimes in high-class malls, there are elevator attendants who ask you what floor you want to go to. Sadly, there wasn't one this time. I kind of expected that, but it would have been nice to see one there. I love their outfits. I think they're quite neat. I imagine they might have had one in days gone by. Anyway, like I was saying, on the fifth floor, I boarded the elevator. The two other passengers got out, leaving me all alone inside. The elevator continued its descent to the third floor, when all of a sudden the lights went out, and the sound of electricity around me went silent. It looked like a power cut, and that made me feel very nervous. Since I was the only one in the elevator right now, I didn't hold back my thoughts on the situation. I used some pretty creative expletives that day and I'm glad that no one was listening. When the cloud of frustration had lifted, I was left in a strange and increasingly frightening situation. I was now stuck in the dark in an elevator. I was pretty certain the elevator was older than I was. At that point, I remember trying to convince myself the elevator would start moving at any moment. I was very concerned for my safety. What if it dropped suddenly? What if something else happened? As much as I tried to believe that I wouldn't be stuck in what was essentially a metal coffin for much longer, I couldn't shake the feeling it would be a long time before I saw the light of day again. That got me thinking. It was strange. Wouldn't the emergency lights at the very least come on if there was an elevator malfunction? That strengthened my belief in the fact there was a total power outage. A blackout of sorts. Quite literally, I cursed the store and its ancient elevator, even myself for even turning into the parking lot to check it out. All these thoughts happened pretty quickly. I wasn't in the dark very long before I pulled out my smartphone to give myself some light. Now that I could actually see and it was a bit brighter, I managed to calm myself down a little. I stood with my back against the innermost wall. I don't know why I did that really. Maybe it was just instincts. I was fixated on my phone, but as you might imagine, I did not get a signal in this 1970s elevator, nor did the department store provide any Wi-Fi. In effect, my phone was little more than an expensive light source. I looked up from my phone and casually tore the doors, where I got the fright of my life. I saw someone was suddenly standing there. I was completely shocked. I had been alone in the elevator. I was certain there was a woman in front of me. She had a small frame, and her long hair was dangling downward. She had her back facing toward me, and was wearing a nice dress. I was certain I wasn't seeing things, but I was also certain I'd been alone only a few moments ago. I'm one of those people who just kinda totally freezes up when something unexpected happens. It may have only been for a couple of seconds that I froze, but I did nonetheless. I didn't want to look at her, but I couldn't look away. In my heart, I just kept praying to all the known gods for this to be a hallucination, for her not to turn around and look at me. If I stayed perfectly still, then maybe she wouldn't notice me. A few random thoughts passed through my head. Was I on one of those prank TV shows? Was I hallucinating because of asbestos or lead paint in this place? Random thoughts kept popping through my head. Next, I did something that's probably going to sound completely mad. I locked my phone and put it away in my pocket. I was now afraid of what I could see in the light. I thought she might look at me and I knew I'd lose it if she did. My eyes slowly grew accustomed to the darkness though and the shapes and silhouettes. She was there. She was still there with her back facing me, head facing the corner where all the buttons were. Meanwhile, I could only wait. I was sweating, on the verge of hyperventilation. I was determined not to make a sound. Just at the moment, I had almost managed to convince myself I was just seeing things. I saw her start to move. She still kept her back toward me, 
but now she'd moved slightly closer to the control panel. While she walked, her feet made no sound. It was like I was watching a show on mute. I started shaking. I thought I was about to scream. I just didn't know what to do. It looked like she was pressing a button over and over, but nothing happened. That was when I heard her speak. What floor did you fall from into the dark? She turned to me, and I saw her hollowed, sunken eyes. Just when I was about to scream and shout my lungs out, the light suddenly came back on. At the same time, I heard a voice come over on the intercom. To all our customers, we apologize for the inconvenience. We suffered a temporary power outage, but we're all back up and running now. I turned toward the corner of the elevator, where the woman had just been. She was gone. The doors opened on the third floor, and I got the hell out of there as fast as I could. I looked up the store on a couple of websites, trying to find some local news or something. I didn't get much, but I did find something on Oshimotero. That's a website in Japan that shows you the locations of properties where incidents have happened. I found there was a little flame mark, which indicated that something had gone down at that mall. Apparently, a young woman had been killed by being pushed into the elevator shaft. I never went back to that department store again. I get anxiety when riding the elevator alone these days. I'll never forget that voice, or that face I saw in the darkness that day. My name is Austin. I'm a 26-year-old man, and this story took place about a month ago. This occurred on a trip my fiancé and I were on. We had just moved down to Florida for a chance at some better opportunities, especially for myself from where I was living previously. My fiancé had to sacrifice a lot for this transition, though, so to help ease the stress a bit, we decided to go on a weekend trip to Universal Orlando Resort and have a fun time together. We had planned out everything ahead of time. With the tickets being so much money, we opted to go for a cheaper hotel to bring the price down a bit. Turned out that was a big mistake. We arrived at the hotel the day before we were supposed to visit the resort. We could immediately see why it was so cheap. The sign said Quality Inn, but from the looks of it, it was previously a run-down hotel some company had bought and slapped their own name on the sign. The room was nothing special at all. In fact, as soon as I sat down on the bed, the frame broke right away. First clue as to just how bad this place really was. We didn't spend too much time in the room, though, as we planned to go to a movie that night anyway. We just quickly dropped off our bags and left. By the time we got back, it was around 11pm or so. I was really tired and I had quite a bad migraine. I quickly changed for bed and laid down, hoping I could just fall asleep. My head was really throbbing. My fiancé did the same shortly after, and before long we both drifted off. Before I continue, I'll explain the layout of the room briefly. As soon as you walk in, to the right are two beds with a night table in between them. To the left was a table and a dresser where the TV sat, and if you kept going straight, you would walk to the sink and bathroom area. A typical hotel room layout, really. My fiancé always needs to face the door when she sleeps, as it makes her feel more at ease. She was pressed up right against my chest so it woke me immediately the moment I felt her suddenly jolt up. She tapped on my shoulder and whispered to me that she could hear someone at the door. She said it sounded like they were trying to get it open. I couldn't hear anything myself, but the sound of her voice made me believe she was not making this up. We sat there listening in for what felt like forever. It was only around ten more seconds before I did hear something. It was the sound of someone trying to open the door with a key card. Before I even had the chance to speak, the door suddenly opened. Fortunately, my fiancé was smart and had put the door latch on before we went to bed. Through the crack in the door, I could just about see an eye peering in at us. 
I immediately jumped up from the bed and yelled, Wrong room, buddy! The man then mumbled something unintelligible. Whoever it was, they seemed to be under the influence of something, or speaking in a language I couldn't understand. What he did next, though, didn't need words to explain. He tried with his whole body to shove the door open. I yelled at him again, this time with more force in my voice, trying to scare him away. I'm not the most imposing guy, but I am somewhat well-built for my height and size. I was unable to, though. After I shouted at the man, he stopped pushing on the door for a brief moment before charging his shoulder into it, trying to break it down. My fiancé screamed and told me to stop the man from coming in. From what I could see through the door's crack, the guy was pretty hefty. Had to be at least six foot one and over 250 pounds. There was no way I was going to be able to stop him with just strength alone. I grabbed the car keys off the table and held them in my hand with the keys between my fingers. I decided that if this man managed to get into our room, I would swing until I could not anymore. I ran over to the door and flung my whole body against it, throwing the man back just enough for the door to shut again. He immediately charged back and threw his whole weight into it, screaming something I couldn't understand. Next to the door, there was a window, where I finally got a good glimpse of the man. It confirmed his predictions of his size compared to mine. To my surprise, I also saw a woman, who I could only assume was his wife, along with two kids by their side. I couldn't believe this guy was acting this way in front of his own family. I was snapped back to reality by my fiancé screaming that she was going to call the police. Suddenly, the man stopped and I could see him ushering the woman and kids away into an SUV. Moments later, they shot off into the night. I didn't know exactly where they went, but I told my fiancé to call the front desk anyways, to let them know what just happened. Nobody answered, so I decided to go to the desk myself and speak to whoever was working that shift that night. I walked into the lobby where a line was already forming, so I had to wait. After about 20 minutes, I was second in line when a lady approached the counter and spoke. When she started to speak, the words she said sent a chill down my spine. Hey, we just used this key card to get into the room, but there were already people in there. It was the wife, the man who'd almost busted down my door. I immediately started to look around. Once I looked behind me and out the doors that opened into the lobby... I could see the same man standing there beside his SUV. I didn't make a move, not wanting to draw attention to myself. I turned my head back toward the desk and kept it that way. The lady left with a new key card. It was then that I approached the desk and explained what happened to me. The lady behind the desk told me it was her fault. She had given those people the key to our room by accident. I was so angry that this woman seemed to act as if whatever had just happened to my fiancé and I wasn't anything to be particularly concerned about. I told her to write down a note that I would be back in the morning to speak with the manager about leaving early and getting a refund. I was more pissed off than I cared to admit. My fiancé didn't want to stay there for the night, but it was already too late to find another place. We relented and once morning hit, we packed our bags and made our way to the front desk. We fully expected the manager to have been filled in on what happened, but once we got there, we found out that was not the case at all. The manager didn't know anything, and even said he'd asked the woman working the night shift if anything in particular had happened that night. She told him no, that nothing had. I was more pissed off now. The manager gave us a refund and checked us out early, while apologizing profusely. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. Thankfully, the rest of the trip was pretty great, and we had a good time at the resort. I'm glad my fiancé had the awareness to put the latch on the door that night, because without it, that man could have simply walked right in. Even with his family standing right there, he acted like a deranged lunatic. I was prepared to attack him if he managed to get inside. Something really horrible could have happened that night, over a simple misunderstanding. Always be aware of your surroundings, and never compromise when it comes to your personal safety.
What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback for me as well, be sure to leave that in the comments below the video. If you guys have a story you'd like to send in, or if you'd like to contact me for any reasons, there will be links to my social media in the description below the video, including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description below the video. Please make sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to use as much proper grammar as possible to make sure you have the highest chance of appearing in a future video. Overall, I think that's pretty much it for now, guys, so thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.